Good to see you again. Go to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. If you're using that Bible in the pew in front of you, that's page 1023. 1 John is in the back, almost the very back of your Bible. So it's, it's easiest to start at the very end and then go left, like four books. 1 John, there's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and then Jude and Revelation. Okay, so start all the way to the right and then go back to the left. 1 John chapter 4. Chapter numbers, of course, are those big numbers, and the verse numbers are those little numbers in their Bible. 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. We're in a series here at Central Oaks called Like Father, Like Son, Bearing the Marks of Authentic Faith. And I'm preaching through the book of 1 John. Today's title is on your screen, and I didn't write it in my notes. I'm sorry to say. I cannot remember it. <laughs> Showing his hand how to know God abides in you. Wow, that was hopeful for you, right? You're like, you didn't even know the title of the sermon. Why am I here today? I got everything else written right in front of me. I just didn't write the title. I don't know. What are titles? They're not important. Come on. First John chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Let's read this together. Let's stand together as we honor God's word among us. No one has ever seen God. Of course, God is invisible. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. How? Because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This is God's very word. Would you be seated, please? So I've been keeping up with the presidential race. How many of you have been keeping up with the presidential race? You want to just, you know, humiliate yourself in front of all of us and say that you've been keeping up. I don't know why I've been keeping up. It's like a joke, it feels like. But uh, anyway, keep, keeping up with the presidential race. And um, I've, I'm sure you, you, have, you have noticed one thing. If you've been watching closely, I've been watching both uh, debates, by the way, both Republicans and Democrats. I've been noticing one theme that all the Republican presidential candidates try to say and do. They all want to, to tout themselves. They all want to act like they're the next Ronald Reagan. Every single one. Of course, Ronald Reagan was the 40th president of the United States from, I think it was 81 to 89. I'm not that smart. I just looked it up on Wikipedia, and you can too. Um, so, anyway, so Ronald Reagan, you know, he's like this Republican hero. And I'm not getting into politics here. I'm just using that example, okay? He's this Republican hero, and all these presidential candidates, they want to tout themselves as the next Ronald Reagan, you know? Ronald Reagan did it this way, and so I'm really a lot like Ronald Reagan, you know, in an effort to try to win votes in the Republican primary is what these presidential candidates are doing. But you know the thing is about politicians, they, have you ever noticed this? They sometimes say things that aren't true. <laughs> Maybe you've noticed that once or twice. They, they say things that aren't true, you know, and so they all want to claim that they're the next Ronald Reagan in the flesh. But how can you really tell which one will most be like Ronald Reagan. That's the question, right? Everybody says they're going to be like him, but the question is, how can you tell who actually will be like the candidate that they're talking about? A lot of Americans say that they are Christians. A lot of Americans, most Americans, say that they are Christians. The question is, how can you tell the difference between a real Christian, a real child of God, and somebody who's just trying to win votes, so to speak. 
That's our purpose today. John is writing this book, the book of 1 John, in, in, in the midst of people who are being encouraged to reject Christ. These people in, who he's writing, writing to, they had believed in the gospel. They had believed in Christ. They were real Christians. They are real Christians. But they are being tempted to turn away and to believe something different about Christ. And so John wants them to know what a real Christian is so that they will then recognize that in themselves and be assured of their faith and be built up so that they will then continue to believe in Christ and continue to to follow Christ. Here is his purpose is mainly assurance for the believer. How the Christian can know that they really do know God. And he gives us two questions in that today. I want to give you a definition of a word before I move into my main purpose. And the definition is the, of the word abide, if you're a note taker. You can write this down in your program or your bulletin. Abide is this word that he uses a lot. John loves this word abide. He uses it in the gospel when Jesus said, abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me. Okay, John uses that in his gospel. And he uses that here in 1 John a lot too. Did you see it several times here in our text? He said, verse 12, God abides in us. His love is perfected in us. And again in verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he abides in us. We abide in love and this abide, okay? Here's the definition. It's, it's to dwell in or to remain in or stay connected to. It's to keep believing in Christ. It's to remain connected to. To not turn away from Christ or from whatever you're abiding in. So I wanted to give you that before we, we begin today. My purpose today, friends, is to ask you two questions. Two questions that can help you determine whether or not God abides in you. The answer to these two questions can help you determine whether or not God abides, lives in, is connected to, dwells in you. And I think this is important today. After I ask those two questions from our text, then we'll consider why these two evidences prove that God is in you. Here's the first question. Here's the first question if you're a note taker. First question from our text, that if it's true of you, then God abides in you. Do you confess Christ as the Son of God? Do you confess Christ as as the Son of God. Look with me at verses 14 and 15 again in your text. If you close your Bible, just open it right back up. Nobody's going to make you feel silly. Verses 14 and 15. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Here it is. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he abides in God. So here is the first question you've got to ask yourself from this text. Do you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Now, that seems like a, a weird word because sometimes people confess, I mean, they say things, but that doesn't necessarily have a lot of implications. They don't understand the implications of what they're trying to say. You know, I, I confess that I did this. What does he mean when he says, if you confess? He means to declare it as true. To, to, to confess something is to say, I believe this is right. I believe this is true. I confess. I declare. I proclaim that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. If you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in the way that He means, then it's evidence that God abides in you. Now, here's something that you need to know for, regarding background information, okay? The false teachers that were trying to pervert these Christians, they claimed that Jesus wasn't really God in the flesh. That's their basis for their whole false teaching. Jesus isn't really God in the flesh. So here's why he says this is the crux of what you have to believe. Because this is what the false teachers were saying you didn't have to believe. Are you with me? So, this is why he says this. Also, he says it in this kind of way. That, I mean, let me back up. It seems like a strange thing to say. It, 
doesn't seem like that's enough information. You know what I mean? Just to simply confess that Jesus is the Son of God, I mean, that's, that's it. That's all that has to be true to be a Christian. Don't you have to believe, like, you know, the virginity of Mary? Don't you have to believe, like, Jesus' death on the cross? Don't you have to believe, like, resurrection, that kind of stuff? It seems too simple to me. And so I want you to understand why this actually makes sense. Look at verse 14. Here is the summary of the gospel. We have seen and testify, here's the good news of Christ, that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Now that is all of Christianity in one verse. The Father, God Himself, has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. That's the gospel. And the next verse is a kind of short phrase that summarizes the whole thing. If you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, then you're confessing verse 14. You're confessing that verse 14 is also true. Here's also why it makes sense. You can't believe that Jesus is God's Son and reject His purpose. You can't believe that Jesus is God's son and reject his purpose. Why would you say, I believe that Jesus is God's son, but then I just don't really care about anything else he did on the earth? No, no, no. If he's the son of God, if he's really the son of God, then don't you think that has an impact on how you engage with him? See what I'm saying? Yes? Why would you say that you believe that Jesus is the son of God? and then not want to live for him. Like, either, that doesn't make sense. You don't really believe that he's the son of God if you're not willing to live your life for him. Are you with me? This is why this statement is so important. If you confess, if you have this belief that Jesus is God's son, then all the implications of that trickle down. Have you ever said something that after you said it, you didn't quite realize the implications of what you were saying? Anybody? It's like the, the time when uh, my wife said, sure, I'd love to watch the Lord of the Rings marathon with you. She said it, but she didn't quite understand the implications of what she was saying, you know. It's like, yeah, you know, you're talking to your coworker. Punching my boss in the face does sound like fun. Yes, you know, you say it, but you don't quite understand the implications of what you're saying. Sure, babe, I'd love to do our taxes this year instead of you, you know. Bad idea. You say things. Some people say they confess Jesus as God's son, but they don't understand the implications of what they're saying in that statement. It's not just simply saying the words. It's understanding that Jesus is God. That what he says is true. That he died on the cross. And that I owe him my complete allegiance because of who he is. You have to understand the implications of what you're saying when you confess. It's not just, well, I confess, I say this word. I confess, Jesus is the Son of God. Therefore, I'm going to heaven. No, 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 no. Do you know what you're confessing when you say that? Do you know what you're believing when you say that and what the implications are for your life. That is the important part. Matthew chapter 14 verse 33, those in the boat after Jesus performed a miracle, they said they worshiped him and they said, truly you are the son of God. This is their, this is their allegiance of faith and if you confess this today, then that is evidence that God is abiding in you. Hmm. There's this uh, story by, about Richard Stearns. I just want to read it to you a little bit. His, it's his testimony, okay? He said, years ago, I was dating this young woman named Renee, whom I loved very much. The only problem was that she was a committed Christian and I was an atheist. And to her, the truth that God had sent his son Jesus to teach us, forgive us, and offer us a new way of life to live changed everything about her life, including who she, sh she would marry, which is right, by the way. I don't fully understand this, he says. I was one of those what's true for you may not be true for me kind of people. 
Why couldn't we just all be happy? I couldn't believe in Jesus just because he was a nice person and he made me feel good. I needed evidence that Christianity was actually true. So prompted by my love for the girl I would someday marry, I decided to research the claims of this whole Christianity deal. I read everything from comparative religion and philosophy to archaeology, science, faith, apologetics, and history. My mind raised as I considered, maybe for the first time ever, the fundamental questions of our lives. And I, he said, I won't try to summarize that. But he will share his conclusion. Here it is. I came to believe that the most plausible explanation for the universe was that God was real. And he had created all that we see. That there was a painter behind this incredible painting. An author behind this astonishing story. I also came to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed God incarnate. That means in flesh. That God had taken human form in order to inaugurate a new chapter and deeper kind of relationship with us. I base my belief on both historical evidence for the resurrection and also the inherent ring of truth I found in Scripture. It had a depth and a solidity to it, a consistency that spoke for itself, that felt self-evident. The evidence for the historicity, the fact that it's historical, of the resurrection of Jesus seemed as, as true as the evidence that Julius Caesar had been the emperor of Rome. You see, what was it that hinged his faith? That Jesus is the Son of God. And if you truly understand what you're confessing when you say that, you really believe, if you really confess that Jesus is the Son of God, then that's evidence that God abides in you and that you abide in God. There's the first question to ask. Do you confess that Jesus is the Son of God? Here's the second question to ask. You doing okay? Here's the second question for you to ask. Are you are you abiding in God's love? Are you abiding in God's love? Look with me at verses 12 and then 16. Verse 12, he says, No one has ever seen God, and lived, that is, or seen Him fully anyway. If we love one another, God abides in us. In other words, if we have this heart of love for other people, especially Christians, then it is evidence that God lives in us. Because God is love. It's who He is. And His love will flow through people who have believed and who have been impacted by His love. That's what He says in verse 12. Now look at verse 16. Verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him. Whoever, li whoever lives in and who stays connected to this love of God, whoever stays connected to love of God that they use to love other people, that's evidence that they are abiding in God and that God abides in them. So the question is, are you abiding in God's love? Are you abiding in God's love? Abiding in love, it means continually, more and more, enjoy the love of God and express it to other people. Now, this is a particular kind of love, okay? So, people say, I'm, abi I'm abiding in love. I love pizza. It's great. I'm abiding in I love my wife. I love my spouse. I love my partner. I love my children. I'm abiding in love, you know? No, no, this is a particular kind of love that he's talking about here. He's a particular kind of love. Look at the love. Look at the, the, the lo look at the kind of love that God has. Look again at verse 14. We have seen and testify that God has sent his son to be the savior of the world. This is the love of God. The love that says, I love these people who are my enemies so much. This is God's perspective. I love these enemies of mine so much that I'm going to send my own son to save them. That's the love that lives in Christians. Christians are not Christians simply because they love people that are convenient. Or be that are comfortable. Or that are like them. Christians are characterized by a different kind of love. The love that characterizes Christians is the love that says, this person is a jerk, and they rightfully are a jerk, but I'm going to love them. 
The love of Christians says, this person is annoying and inconvenient to me. This person isn't even right. They're wrong. This person is dirty, is filthy, is a sinner. This person is unworthy. Yes, perhaps that's even true. But I'm going to love them. Why would a Christian do that? Because that's the love that Christians know. Because that's the love that God has given Christians. Christianity is not about cleaning yourself up to make yourself worthy so that God will then find you valuable. No! God loves you when you're in the mud, when you're filthy, and when you're wicked, and when you're running far away from Him. That's when God sent Christ to die for you, friends. And that kind of love, when you know that perfect love of God, it changes you. It changes your heart. And you start expressing that kind of love more and more and more for people around you, especially other Christians, by the way. And you start expressing it. It's who you are. You're abiding in love. You have this love of God for you even though you're a filthy, wicked sinner. And you know He loves you by sending Christ on the cross to die in your place. And you start to spread that love to other people. That is the question. Are you abiding in this love? Man, I love this story. I love this story about uh, Corey Ten Boom. Have you ever heard of Corey Ten Boom? Corey Ten Boom was a, I, f- I forget what uh, nationality she was. She was a Dutch. I love you people. All right. I'm not Dutch, but hopefully you'll still love me. Corey Ten Boom was a, a Dutch woman who helped Jewish people uh, escape from Hitler as he was seeking to kill them. And um, she, she, you know, it's a really famous lady, this incredible story of faith about how she helped people escape from this terror. She credits her father's example, by the way, in inspiring her to help the Jews of Holland. She tells them an incident in which she asked a pastor who was visiting their home to help shield a mother and newborn infant. He replied, no, definitely not. We could lose our lives for that Jewish child. She went on to say, unseen by either of us, father had opened, had appeared in the doorway. Her father said, give the child to me, Corey. Father held the baby close, his white beard brushing its cheek, looking into the little face with eyes as blue and innocent as the baby's. You could say, here's what they said, you say we could lose our lives for this child. I would consider that the greatest honor that could come to my family, is what her dad said. Why did Corey Tin Boom have the kind of self-sacrificial love and putting her life on the line for Jewish people in that time, she saw it in her father. Her father had that kind of love. And it trickled down into her, and she expressed that kind of love. Where do Christians get that kind of love? It's our father who is loved in that kind of way. We love because he first loved us. Friends, are you abiding in this kind of love? A love that enjoys the love that God has for you in Christ and that gives that love to other people selflessly? That is a sign, friend, that you are abiding in God and that God abides in you. There's the second question. Are you abiding in love? First question, do you confess that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, why, why do these two evidences prove that God lives on us, in us? Here it is, here it is. Because the Holy Spirit of God is the one who causes these things. The Holy Spirit of God is the only one who can cause these things. Look with me again at verse 13. Verse 13 in your text. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. He has given us of His Spirit. And the Spirit of God is the one who leads us to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. And the Spirit of God is the one who leads us to love other people as God has loved us. And if the Spirit is in you, friends, then you abide in God. And God abides in you. That's a Christian, friends. 
Listen, what does he say? What does it say in Galatians 4, 6? Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into you, your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's you if you're a child of God. Acts 5.32, we, wit- we are witnesses of these things. Talking about Jesus Christ, the person preaching there. And so is the Holy Spirit a witness to these things. What did Jesus teach about the Holy Spirit before he ascended back up into heaven? In John chapter 15, verse 26, the Spirit of truth will bear witness about me. And he says again in chapter 16, verse 13, he, that is the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth. And so if you're confessing the truth, truth about who God is, the Holy Spirit is the one who leads you to confess that truth. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads you to love other people. It's not your love. It's the love of God flowing through you. It's the Spirit of God in you. Have you ever heard anybody say, he's got the Spirit? Anybody, you ever heard anybody say that? He's got the Holy Spirit. He's got the Holy Ghost. He's got the Spirit, you know. And what they mean generally by that is that he's doing, he or she, they're doing some kind of expression that's full of joy or vigor or, or, or speaking a certain kind of way or something like that. Well, he's got the Holy Spirit, you know. And, so, and the way that you can tell is by what they're doing and expressing themselves in worship. That's not the way John describes who has the Holy Spirit in John. That's not the way how he describes the anointing. He says, you have the anointing. The anointing abides in you. And what does the anointing do? It leads you to truth. The Holy Spirit, the evidence of the Holy Spirit is that you confess Christ. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is that you love the brothers. That's a spirit-filled person friends. Don't tell me that some people want to express joy, and that's good in worship, express certain characteristics in worship, but they don't love their brothers. They're not as full of the Spirit as they might let on, friend. Don't tell me that somebody wants to have an emotional experience in worship, but they don't confess Christ as Lord. They're not full of the Spirit, friends. They might be full of a Spirit, but it's not the Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit lead you to do? He leads you to confess Christ as Lord. He leads you to love your brothers. I've never seen someone more full of the Spirit than when they wash one another's feet. I don't mean literally, necessarily. I've never seen someone more full of the Spirit than when they serve, than when they sacrifice for another friend and brother in Christ. I've never seen someone more full of the Spirit than when they confess that Jesus is my God and my Lord. That's fullness of the Spirit, according to John, friends. Not some kind of necessarily emotional response. Hmm. Show me someone, show me someone who sacrificially cares for his brothers and sisters in Christ, friends, and I'll show you someone filled with the Spirit of Christ. Show me someone who professes Jesus as God and I'll show you, show you someone who is filled with the Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of Christ is in you, then you are God's. You belong to Him. You're His. Here's the questions. Do you confess Jesus Christ as God? That only comes from the Holy Spirit in the way when what it really means. That only comes from the Holy Spirit. Do you abide in love, the love of God for you and his love that you're giving to other people? Do you abide in that? Do you remain in that? Is that something that's a characteristic, increasing characteristic of your life? That's the Holy Spirit that does that, friends. And if those things are true in you, then you are a child of God. That is a Christian. Rest assured today. Now, you can't fake love. Isn't that just, you know, all these politicians, you know, I I probably should be careful what I say right now. Um, they say they're going to be like Ronald Reagan, right? You can't really tell about the spirit of Ronald Reagan, which one he's in, until they start living, until they start getting into office, can you? And you can't just change that. You can't just bring up a heart affection for something. You can't just start to love people in this kind of way. Lindsay and I, not Lindsay, Caroline and I, my daughter, we built a, a snowman, a snow woman. Yeah, snow woman. 
You can do that. A snow, a snow woman in our front yard over here, right beside. And uh, so it's the first time we've ever built a snow man or woman. And uh, yesterday, and uh, so we, you know, we're I'm, I'm doing like about 99.8 percent of the work, you know, but because she's two and a half, which is fun, you know. Um, so we're building the snow woman, and you know, you get the big base together, you know, and you put the middle part, and put the top part, and then we start to give it little characteristics that make it look more human-like, you know. I mean, you know, we got these little grapes, and I got this little, uh, was it like a melon ball scooper, and I scoop out the eyes, you know, and I put the grapes in there with the stem sticking out so it looks like a pupil, <laughs> you know. And then I put the snow, and I packed the snow in around the eyeballs, you know, and then, um, uh, t you know, and it looks, you know, that's, that's legit, you know. It looks almost... Olaf or something, you know. Um, you know, you take, I took, took the scarf, you know, you put the scarf, we put a little, it was an orange, orange bow in the snow, it's snow girl, orange bow in the snow girl's head, you know, lifelike, you know, it's like coming to life. I thought about that song from Frosty the Snowman, must have been that old top hat that they found it, and once he put it on his hat, he began to dance around, you know, so I'm singing that song in my head. Uh, you know, we put the, the, uh, the grapes in the, for the buttons, you know, in the chest, and we put these two sticks in the side of the snow woman. I put this, I carve out this little place for a mouth and I put a little stick and a little smirk, you know, right in the mouth. Some people try to live a Christian life and they're just as dead as a snowman. They're not really alive. But they, they put on the fake smile, you know, they, they try to act the part. They go to church. They force themselves to read their Bible. They don't love it. It's a chore, you know. They begrudgingly give money to charities, you know, things like that. They put the buttons on the snow person, acting like it's real, you know. But there's no life. There's no life in them. They're not alive by the Holy Spirit. They're not a real Christian. Are you, are you like the snow woman? <laughs> just dressing up, just acting the part. No heart affection for the things of God. No love for Christ. No real genuine love for other Christians. But hey, we got that fake twig smile on. You can't fake it. You can't fake it. Nobody walking by our front yard is going to look at that snowman and say, I think that's a real person. <laughs> you can't fake it either. I got some really good news. God himself can take you from being dead and make you alive. How does he do it? Because when you were dead in your sins, Christ died for your sins and then rose again from the dead so that if you believe in Him, you will be resurrected out of your dead state. Alive, full of the Spirit of God, full of love for God, full of confession of Jesus as God's Son, full of God Himself if you will believe in Christ today. Let's pray together. Our musicians are going to come. Friends, if you don't know Jesus Christ today, then I, here's how you can do it. It's very simple. Just think about four simple things. Simple to understand, but difficult to to come to, I, I, I suppose. First thing is that you have to admit your need. You have to admit that you are a sinner, that you are dead, that you, you cannot come to God on your own, that, that you, the way you've been living your life, you're like that dead snowman. There's no life in you. There's no spiritual life. You're dead in your sins, and you're worthy of God's judgment. You have to admit that. The second thing, you have to believe that Christ died on the cross in your place and rose again from the dead to forgive you of your sins and give you new life. The third thing, you have to invite Christ to live in you and be your Lord and Savior, to, to take control of everything you are, 
to entrust your whole life to Him, to let Him be your King, you have to do that in your heart. If you'd like to do that today, you can do that right now in your, right now in your pew. You can pray to Him and confess those things as true of your heart this morning. And friends, I pray that those of you that know Him would continue to remain in Him, that you would abide in Him and continue to cling on to Him as your only hope, that you would continue to confess Christ as a Son of God and continue to remain in the love of God, the love that He has for you and the love that He wants you to give for others. Lord, Lord Christ, we are so grateful for your faithfulness in your word and speaking to us today. And I ask that you'd be a faithful preacher of your word today as we wait for you and, and uh, wait for you to apply this to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would bring new life to dead people today in this place, across this room. That you would cause them to be born again by your Holy Spirit through the gospel. We ask these things for your sake.